So good day, dear doctors. This is Doc Toom. Welcome to our internal medicine blitz for the subspecialty of rheumatology. So for this module, we will summarize the must-knows of chapter 355, which is entitled the spondyloarthritides. We're gonna talk about the spondyloarthropathies mentioned in this chapter, lifted from Harrison's Principles of Internal Medicine 20th edition. So let's begin our blitz. Now, if we read the textbook and we create a mind map about what actually are the spondyloarthritides, these are a group of diseases which has overlapping clinical features, genetic associations, and pathogenic mechanisms. And that is why they are all lumped together under the umbrella of spondyloarthritides. So again, a constellation of diseases which share or have overlapping clinical features, genetic associations, and pathogenic mechanisms. So that is basically the spondyloarthritides. Now, there are actually about six classic designations of the spondyloarthritides. As you can see here, I created an image which shows you that they are overlapping. Nag-overlap sila because they share the same clinical features, same genetic considerations, as well as the same manifestations or pathogenesis. So we have under the spondyloarthritides, we have ankylosing spondylitis, which we will focus on. We have psoriatic arthritis. We have the undifferentiated spondyloarthritis, the enteropathic arthritis, the reactive arthritis. Then we have the juvenile onset spondyloarthritis. Now, if there is a standard exam you're preparing for, you should focus on AS, which is ankylosing spondylitis, and you should focus on reactive arthritis, okay? And that is where the bulk of the discussion is in the textbook. And in this module, we're gonna insert the key concepts about psoriatic arthritis according to Harrison's, okay? So again, the overlapping diseases or syndromes with focus on ankylosing spondylitis as well as reactive arthritis, okay? Now, always take note that the spondyloarthritides can actually be divided into two big groups we have the predominantly H-shell spondyloarthritides, and we have the predominantly peripheral spondyloarthritides. So everyone has to memorize. The first group is H-shell. The second group is peripheral. So the classification of these two subgroups is actually based on what part of the musculoskeletal system is involved. So H-shell, which means it affects the spine, the thoracic cage, as well as the pelvis. Then we have the peripheral, which classically affects the extremities. So again, the spondyloarthritides, which is a constellation of several diseases with overlapping genetic considerations, clinical features, as well as pathogenic mechanisms, can be divided into two. We have the predominantly HL, 
and the predominantly peripheral spondyloarthritis. The fastest to memorize here is the peripheral because the peripheral means it affects only the extremities. If it affects the spine, the pelvis, as well as the thoracic cage, then this is the eggshell spondyloarthritis. Now, question, can you have an overlap of both classifications or groups? Yes or no. Can you have a spondyloarthritis which involves both eggshell as well as peripheral? So the answer is yes. That's why the term predominant is there, okay? There can be an overlap, most especially as the disease progresses, okay? Now, first and foremost, let's talk about ankylosing spondylitis and the eggshell spondyloarthritis, okay? So we have AS or ankylosing spondylitis and the eggshell spondyloarthritis. So let's begin with AS. So AS is an inflammatory disorder of unknown cause. So you have to remember it's inflammation, hence the term itis, okay? Now the cause is unknown and it affects the axial skeleton. So if someone were to ask you, how do I memorize this? A, S, letter A, how does letter A sound? Ah, uh, ah, uh. and what's the reaction of someone if they don't know the answer? Unknown, they're gonna say, um, um, and it is ah, uh, ah, uh, eggshell, okay? So the letter A sounds like ah, uh, ankylosing spondylitis. The cause is unknown, okay? And it's eggshell involvement, axial skeleton. Now, aside from the axial skeleton, what is interesting, okay, is there can be involvement of the peripheral joints as well as extra articular structures. But again, AS is predominantly axial. Now, there's a term used in Harrison's, which is the AXSPA, which stands for axial spondyloarthritis. So this is the term which is commonly used right now, AX, SPA. Now the estimated prevalence of AX, SPA is about 0.9 to 1.4%. Doc, do I have to memorize this number? No, you don't, but it's mentioned in the book, okay? Now, I wanna insert this so that you will understand the features as well as the manifestations of ankylosing spondylitis. So just some definition of terms. This isn't found in Harrison's, but I believe I should mention this to you. From the term ankylosis and spondylitis. So when we say ankylosis, there is stiffness, okay, very important. There's stiffness of a joint. So there's stiffness of a joint and there is rigidity of the bones of the joint. Then we have spondylitis, which is inflammation of the vertebrae. So if you put ankylosing spondylitis together, you're gonna get the keywords of number one, inflammation, number two, stiffness or rigidity. So please input this in your head. Inflammation, then we have stiffness or rigidity. So ankylosing, spondylitis, okay? Now for the epidemiology, it usually begins in the second or the third decade with the majority as mentioned in the textbook within their mid twenties, okay? So it usually begins in the second or the third decade uh, with a mean of the mid twenties. Now, North American whites please take note that there's a very important HLA, which is the B27. In North American whites, the prevalence of HLA B27 is about 7%. And in patients with ankylosing spondylitis, the HLA prevalence B27 now increases 
to 75 to 90 percent. So there is a striking correlation with HLA B27. In fact, ankylosing spondylitis is considered to be the most common seronegative spondyloarthropathy. It's the most common seronegative spondyloarthropathy, which is associated with HLA-B27. Now, Doc, do I have to memorize something in this slide? The answer is yes. Do not let the day end without memorizing HLA-B27. Okay, please take note of this. HLA-B27. Now, can you think of another disease that can present with arthritis and is also HLA-B27 positive? Okay, anyone? Okay, what is that syndrome under reactive arthritis? Okay, reactive arthritis is correct. What is that syndrome of reactive arthritis that presents with urethritis, conjunctivitis, uh, uveitis, as well as uh, arthritis? Okay, very good. It's the Reiter's syndrome. Okay, Reiter's syndrome. Now, I want everyone to remember this, okay? Ankylosing spondylitis, it's commonly known as AS. This is also known as Marie Strumpel disease. This is also known as Marie Strumpel disease or what we call Bechterou. Bechterou's disease, okay? So please take note of this, okay? Again, please take note of this. We have Marie Strumpel disease and Bechterou's disease. Earlier, we mentioned that there is a syndrome okay, that presents with urethritis, arthritis, as well as uveitis. This is the famous Reiter's syndrome. Reiter's syndrome is also associated with HLA B27. So please take note of that. Now, I want everyone to look at this photo, okay? Uh, this is the sacroiliac joint. Inflammation of the sacroiliac joint is very common. In fact, it's one of the early manifestations of ankylosing spondylitis. Now, please take note. Patients with axial spondyloarthritis that do not, take note, have radiologic criteria for ankylosing spondylitis are now labeled as the non-radiographic axial spondyloarthritis. So that's called NRAX. So I'll give you a minute to go over this slide as well as stretch while you can. So please take note, patients with axial spondyloarthritis that do not have the radiologic features are now considered to be labeled as the non-radiographic axial SPA, okay? Now, memorize this and bring this with you to the exam. What is the earliest manifestation of ankylosing spondylitis as well as the non-radiographic HL SPA? It is the presence of sacroilitis. Now, what you see here, uh, right in between the white arrows, this is the sacroiliac iliac joint, an inflamed sacroiliac joint. So please take note of this. Again, please take note of this. So sacroilitis 
is often the early manifestation of ankylosing spondylitis, as well as non-radiographic shell spondyloarthritis. Now for the earliest changes, okay, this is a tough chapter in the book because it's all in paragraph. You might be lost in the paragraph. So I'm creating mind maps and illustrations for you to hopefully pick up the things which you're supposed to be highlighting, familiarizing yourself with, and of course, memorizing for your written exam. So the earliest changes actually begins this is pathogenesis, a pathology rather. It begins with synovitis. Then there's gonna be myxoid changes in the bone marrow. And this is acute, so this is early. In the later stage, there's going to be the formation of panos. So there's the panos formation, as well as the formation of subchondral granulation tissue. So if you notice with chronicity, follows fibrosis or granulation tissue. So during the acute or early stages, there's going to be synovitis and myxoid marrow changes. Subacute to chronic, it's going to be panos formation and the formation of subchondral granulation tissue. Now, there is this term I want you to remember. It's called enthesis, okay? Now, the book does not define what enthesis is, but it goes straight and tells us there is inflammation of the fibrocartilaginous enthesis. The enthesis, okay, is the site of insertion of either a tendon, a ligament, fascia, or articular capsule into a bone. So the site of insertion of a tendon, a ligament, or a fascia, or articular capsule into a bone is known as the enthesis. And please take note, okay, please take note that this enthesis, okay, is the characteristic lesion in ankylosing spondylitis, okay? So always remember there's inflammation of the enthesis. Now, the pathogenesis of ankylosing spondylitis is classically going to be two mechanisms. The first mechanism is an immune mediated mechanism. The second is going to be an auto inflammatory pathogenesis. So number one, it's immune mediated. Number two, it's auto inflammation. Now, what do we call those group of substances which usually have a pro inflammatory effect? Example, interleukin, TNF, what do we generally call this group of substances, chemical substances? They play a very important role in inflammation. Examples are interleukin and tumor necrosis factor. Okay, very good. We call them the cytokines. Okay, so what's the first pathogenic mechanism again? It's immune mediated. Number two, it's going to be auto-inflammation, okay, auto-inflammation. Now, for the immunopathogenesis of ankylosing spondylitis, cytokines play a central role. There are two cytokines you have to pick out, out of, I counted 22 other cytokines mentioned in the paragraphs. Dude, we have to study high yield. These are the two 
inflammatory cytokines that you have to remember regarding the immunopathogenesis of ankylosing spondylitis. Number one is tumor necrosis factor alpha. Number two is interleukin 17A. So make sure you jot that down. We have tumor necrosis factor alpha. Then we have interleukin 17A. For those taking the PSBIM exam, you have to remember things will be lifted verbatim from the textbook. Sobrang detalye. If you read the book, that is your strongest weapon. Next to prayers, of course. If you're taking the PLE and you want to crack open the exam, textbook first, handouts next. Okay, Doc, I don't have enough time. Then try your best to study the book. Doc, I really don't have time. Then study handouts. Doc, I don't have time to study the handouts. Don't take the exam. Okay, so please prepare well. So these are the two take-homes here. Uh, with regards to the cytokines, tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is also known as cachectin, then we have interleukin 17A, okay? So please take note of this. Now, during the early disease, since we're talking about autoinflammation, we're talking about autoimmune processes. So for the autoinflammation, these are the things that happen during early disease. So the sacroiliac joint is inflamed. Does everyone still remember the early manifestation of sac sacroiliitis? Okay, so when you hear ankylosing spondylitis and you're talking about pathogenesis, first thing which should pop into your head is HLA-B27. Next, after HLA-B27 should be sacroiliitis. So this inflamed sacroiliac joint is going to be infiltrated with inflammatory cells. Particularly, we have the CD4 and the CD8 cells. Okay, the CD4 and the CD8 T cells, okay? Remember, auto-inflammatory. And as the disease progresses, the macrophages will come in. And it is clearly stated in the book that there is a report of high levels of tumor necrosis factor alpha. Okay? So please take note of the role of the CD4, CD8 cells and tumor necrosis factor alpha for the sacroiliitis and the early disease manifestations of ankylosing spondylitis, okay? Now for the clinical manifestations, okay? For the clinical manifestations, this is how it looks in the book and this is how I want to summarize it, okay? So this is the mind map that should be in your head. Clinical manifestations, if you listened earlier, I mentioned it's usually in the mid-20s. Early adulthood, late adolescence, okay? Not common to see it in the older age group. The usual initial symptom is gonna be pain, okay? It's a characteristic dull pain, okay? It's insidious, and it's usually felt in the lower lumbar, or the gluteal area. Now, why is it important to lift things verbatim from the book, most especially when it comes to clinical manifestations? Because this is where the clinical vignette or the case scenario pops out. Good examiners lift things from a decent reference. And the most decent and most recommended reference for internal medicine is Harrison's Principles of Internal Medicine. And it clearly describes there the manifestations 
of a dull, aching pain in the lower lumbar area and the gluteal region. Why? What if I tell you it's the lower thoracic? The patient is cachectic. Okay, let me play around with the case scenario. The patient is cachectic. So the patient is basically asthenic, complaining of lower back pain. What are one of the conditions you have to rule out? Look at the age group, young, okay? You have to rule out POTS disease. And let me add the term, the gibbous. Okay, if you are practicing here in the Philippines, you are taking an exam here, put POTS disease on the list. Okay, not so common with regards to our Caucasian counterparts. So let's summarize. You'd expect someone in their mid-20s complaining of low dull lumbar pain or gluteal pain. In the early morning, they're going to complain of low back pain and stiffness. Stiffness and something very important, you have to pick this up, is that this stiffness improves when there is activity and the stiffness returns following inactivity. There can also be bilateral pain as the manifestations progress, and there can be the presence of bony tenderness, most especially in the areas mentioned earlier. And usually in the evening, there's exacerbations of pain because there's inactivity. These nocturnal exacerbations of pain cause the patient to get up from bed, to rise, and to move around just to, let's say, relieve the pain temporarily. So can you picture out how someone would present with ankylosing spondylitis? This is the classic case scenario, okay? Now, common sites of tenderness. Number one, the costosternal junction, the spinous processes, the iliac crest, the greater trochanter, the ischial tuberosity, the tibial tubercles, and the heels. So these are the sites mentioned in our textbook, which are usually involved when it comes to the tenderness, the tender spots. So the common sites of tenderness, one more time, we have the costosternal junction, the spinous processes, the iliac crests, the greater trochanters, the ischial tuberosities, the tibial tubercles, and the heels. Okay, these are the common sites of tenderness. Now, these are the most specific findings you would encounter in ankylosing spondylitis. Okay, there's loss of spinal mobility. Now, can anyone explain to me why there's loss of spinal mobility? Uh, with one or two words, why is there loss of spinal mobility? A short description. A short description. Why is there loss of spinal mobility? Okay, good. Yes, the vertebrae will fuse. There is ankylosis. There is rigidity. There is stiffness. Okay, there is rigidity and stiffness. So there's loss of spinal mobility. There's limitation of both anterior and lateral flexion, as well as extension of the lumbar spine, as well as that of chest expansion. So there is basically rigidity and stiffness. This is the ankylosis part.
Now, I want everyone to memorize this. This is the famous modified Schober test. So the modified Schober test, when you hear modified Schober test, for examination purposes, always think of ankylosing spondylitis first, okay? So this is a test, it's a bedside procedure, which is used to measure lumbar spine flexion. So always remember, in ankylosing spondylitis, is there limitation or is there exaggeration? of lumbar spine flexion. Let's see if you're following me. In ankylosing spondylitis and your spondyloarthropathies, is there limitation or is there exaggeration of the lumbar spine flexion? There is limitation. And what is the name of that test again you perform? to measure lumbar spine flexion, it is called modified Schober test. Now, question, what rheumatologic condition is diagnosed when you perform Schirmer's test? When you perform Schirmer's test, what is your diagnosis? Schirmer's test. Okay, so when you perform Schirmer's test, you are trying to diagnose Jogren's syndrome. When you perform the modified Schober's test, then you are trying to diagnose ankylosing spondylitis. So the instruction is like this. So try picturing this in your head. The patient stands up, okay, stands erect, okay, with the heels together. A okay, very, very important, okay? You're gonna make some marks here. Okay, again, you're gonna make some marks. Now, does anyone know what we call these dimples here? Does anyone know what we call these dimples? Now, those two dimples, which I just encircled, uh, they more or less correspond to the posterior superior iliac spine. What do we call them? Very good. It's called the dimple of Venus. Okay, these are known as the dimples of Venus. Okay, so do you see this here? This area here, look. My dimples, Jana. Those dimples are known as the dimples of Venus and they correspond to the posterior superior iliac spine. So this is your marker. You draw an imaginary line, horizontal imaginary line connecting these dimples, okay? So you mark the lumbosacral junction and you measure about 10 centimeters above. Okay, that's the 10 cm above. So please take note of that. So patient stands erect, heels together, identify the dimples of Venus that corresponds to the posterior superior iliac spine. You draw, not literally draw, but you just picture it out. Don't use a pencil pen. You connect the two landmarks with a horizontal line and you make a mark 10 centimeters above this point. Now here, see this? Get those points there. Patient stands erect. The patient is now instructed to bend forward. So here, the patient is instructed to bend forward with the knees fully extended. You now measure, you now measure uh, the points between the two marks, okay? The distance increases by at least five or more centimeters when there is normal mobility. So five 
is normal. Less than four is decreased mobility. So I just like to remind you, number four sounds like it's poor. Pangit yan. That is abnormal. Okay. So question, what would you expect in ankylosing spondylitis when you perform the modified Schober's test? Would the distance increase or would the distance, okay, decrease? So the distance would decrease, okay? So it's less than four centimeters, which tells you there's decreased mobility. It tells you there is stiffness, okay? Now, the factors most predictive of radiographic progression. What are the factors which are most predictive of radiographic progression? There are three factors mentioned in the textbook. Number one is the presence of syndesmophytes, which I'll explain in a while. The presence of high inflammatory markers, okay? and the history of smoking. So it's discussed in the book that smokers usually have progressive disease, okay? So what are the three factors which are most predictive of radiographic progression? Number one is the presence of existing syndesmophytes, the presence of high inflammatory markers and history of smoking. Now, this is what syndesmophytes are, okay? Syndesmophytes are actually bony outgrowths, okay? They are osseous excrescences or bony outgrowths from the spinal ligaments, okay? So please take note of that, so here, syndesmophytes. So the presence of syndesmophytes can predict progressive disease. Okay, so please take note of that. Now, as you go through the chapter, this should be picked up. The most serious complication of ankylosing spondylitis is a spinal fracture which is specified in the book, usually occurs where? Saan yung most common site of spinal fracture in ankylosing spondylitis? It's the lower cervical spine. Everyone should memorize that, okay? Ang sarap ng feeling when you actually read this in the textbook. My invitation is take 15, 20, 30 minutes to open the book and check the actual chapter. After listening to this session, going over the video when it's uploaded, it's going to make you hopefully have a faster retention time and it should be more high yield, okay? So that you will not lose time going over highlighting the unnecessary things, which is very time consuming. Time is not your ally. So again, the most serious complication is a spinal fracture, which usually involves the lower cervical spine, okay? Now, extra articular manifestations. We mentioned extra articular manifestations. Now, question, what is the most common extra articular manifestation of ankylosing spondylitis? So let's formulate the must-know questions based on the must-know things that should be highlighted from your textbook. 
what is the most common extra articular manifestation okay now i would like to clarify something here because if you read the textbook there's a line there that says anterior uveitis is the most common however they further discuss there that there's usually inflammation of the bowels and this is the basis there 60 percent of those who have inflammation involves the colon and the ilium so it's actually not colitis and elitis which is the most common extra articular it is uveitis the 60 percent refers to those who have inflammation of the gi tract 60 percent of them is colon and ilium so uveitis is actually more common than the GI inflammation. 60% of those with GI inflammation present with involvement of the colon or the ileum. So they can present with colitis or elitis. Now, another very important extra articular manifestation okay, is psoriasis. So I hope that is clear, huh? Answer the uveitis as the most common. Okay. Doc, my 60%, 60% of those with bowel inflammation involves the colon and the ileum. Psoriasis is there. They can also have cardiac manifestations. And of the cardiac manifestations, it's usually aortic insufficiency. This can lead to the third degree heart block, which is discussed in the chapter. So again, extra articular manifestations of ankylosing spondylitis. Number one on the list, uveitis, okay? Colitis, elitis, psoriasis. Then we have aortic insufficiency, which usually leads to what cardiac problem? third degree AV block, okay? It usually leads, it usually leads to third degree AV block. Now, this is what I want you to remember. Remember, when these things are mentioned during the final coaching, you have a superior advantage that you got it straight from the mother textbook, okay? That is better than handouts, okay? So the most common extra articular manifestation, the most common extra articular manifestation of ankylosing spondylitis is, mga anak, my children, is an acute anterior uveitis. Now, question, what is that syndrome again? that can present with arthritis as well as uveitis. What is that syndrome again? Okay, it's actually a form of reactive arthritis that can present with arthritis and uveitis. It's Reiter syndrome. Now, how can you differentiate ankylosing spondylitis with urethritis? Number one, ankylosing spondylitis perform modified Schober's test. Look for rigidity. Look for limitation of movement. Number two, if there's no urethritis, okay, then it doesn't fall under writers. Okay, so please take note of that. Now, the usual description of the anterior uveitis in these patients is usually unilateral anterior uveitis. So they're going to present with pain. They're going to present with increased lacrimation, and they're going to present with photophobia. Now, question. Analyze. How can you rule out this is not Jobrin syndrome? Based on these manifestations here, based on these manifestations here, how can you rule out 
this is not Joe Gren's syndrome. Okay. How can you rule out this is not Joe Gren's syndrome? Precisely. Joe Gren's syndrome is dry eyes. So in ankylosing spondylitis, it is increased lacrimation, okay? So start putting the analysis part in. Now for the laboratory findings, I want you to remember, there is no specific or pathognomonic laboratory test, which is diagnostic of ankylosing spondylitis. However, there is the very strong association of HLA-B27, 75 to 90% of patients with AS is associated with HLA-B27. ESR, C-reactive protein are often elevated, but it is not specific because these are general laboratories, which tells you there's inflammation. There is a report of mild anemia but again, there's no specific laboratory test, which is di diagnostic. Nothing specific. Now, this is where we're gonna zoom in to the textbook. Standard radiographic findings. So it's not actually laboratory blood exams that leads you to clinch the diagnosis but it's more of imaging studies. History, physical exam finding, particularly the modified Schober's, then the standard radiographic findings. Now, these are the earliest changes. Okay. The earliest changes on standard radiography. Memorize this for written exam purposes. We have the blurring of the cortical margins of the subchondral bone. Next, we have the erosions and the sclerosis, okay? So there's three words I want you to memorize here. One is the blurring, next is the erosions, third is the sclerosis. The presence of the erosions leads to the pseudo widening of the joint space. Okay, now does everyone remember this? The famous bamboo spine. Okay, there's gonna be fusion of the vertebrae and it gives you the classic bamboo spine. So there are two important findings, which I would say it's mandatory for you to memorize if you want to crack this disease. The keywords, the buzzwords here, bamboo spine, sacroelitis. Okay, bamboo spine and the sacroelitis. Now, what if I tell you it's not the bamboo spine, but it is the moth-eaten spine? What is your impression? Moth-eaten spine. Okay, what is your diagnosis? Moth-eaten moth spine. Okay, moth-eaten spine. The moth-eaten spine is one of your pathology pearls. Instead of saying lytic or punched out lesions. So again, if I tell you punched out lesions, lytic lesions, very good. It favors multiple myeloma, okay? Multiple myeloma. So I hope you got that. Punched out lesions or lytic lesions, okay, multiple myeloma.
Now, this is the illustration in your textbook. Showing you an MRI. So here, tip of the black arrow here, tip of the pointer. This is the sacroilitis. There's edema there. Okay. In the juxta articular bone marrow. So the asterisk, this is the edema. And the thin arrow, that's the capsule there. So again, sacroilitis is an early or a late finding in ankylosing spondylitis. Is it early or late? Sacroilitis. So what is sacroilitis? Is it an early or is it a late finding? Okay, always remember sacroilitis is an early finding, okay? Now here, uh, I wanna share with you this criteria. Uh, this slide is not found in this edition of Harrison's, but it's found in the previous edition. I think this is very important, okay? So there is chronicity, and the chronicity is a span of more than three months, three or more months, chronic back pain, and you need to have four or more of the following. Number one, age of onset is below 40 years old. Next, the onset is insidious. There's improvement with exercise, no improvement with rest, and there is pain at night. Remember the nocturnal exacerbations. The pain at night improves upon getting up. So I hope you got this picture. Huh? This is very clear cut, very suggestive of ankylosing spondylitis. Again, you most likely have not seen this in your actual training, but you will see this in examinations. So age of onset, we mentioned it's usually mid-20s, onset is insidious. There's improvement with exercise. I really think that this improvement with exercise, this is the clincher here. In the improvement with exercise, that is the clincher. So here's the table lifted from Harrison's. Uh, this is the criteria for the classification of the axial spondyloarthritis. So first you need the imaging finding of sacroilitis plus one or more features of the spondyloarthritis or you have the HLA-B27 positivity with two or more of the SPA features. Now here are the SPA features. There's dactylitis, arthritis, the inflammatory back pain, there's psoriasis. There can be Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. There's a family history there's an elevated CRP, and there's HLA-B27 positivity. Now, if there are some things you should emphasize on, it should be the following. One, inflammatory back pain, okay, the enthesitis and the anterior uveitis. For the dactylitis, you don't have to memorize this because the key word for dactylitis is going to be other syndromes taken up in other modules. The psoriasis, very important is the history of Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. Remember, involvement of either the colon or the ileum. And of course, the HLA-B27. So if there are things you have to emphasize on, memorize the ones that are boxed out. Uh, 
now winding down with the treatment and the therapeutics for ankylosing spondylitis. So please take note, first line of pharmacologic treatment is the NSAIDs, okay? Just be careful if the patient has history of peptic ulcer or upper GI bleeding. Now, if the patient has history of upper GI bleeding, peptic ulcer, H. pylori infection, and has rheumatologic manifestations, what is your alternative drug that you can give as an analgesic? What alternative drug can you give? History of peptic ulcer, history of upper GI bleeding. What alternative drug can you give as an analgesic? Okay, now the least gastric irritation of your common pain relievers would be your acetaminophen, but you have to remember, you have to stay away from NSAIDs, okay, or you should. That's why you have the option to give selective COX inhibitors, okay? Now, back to the treatment. We can give anti-tumor necrosis factor alpha therapy because we mentioned the central role the cytokines play, particularly TNF-alpha. And what's that interleukin again, which plays a central role? What is that interleukin that plays a central role? Okay, interleukin that plays a central role. Okay, it's interleukin 17A. Okay, very good. Interleukin 17A. There are monoclonal antibodies. Okay, there are monoclonal antibodies. So there's infliximab. There's also adalimumab. Okay, mga umab imabs. These are the monoclonal antibodies. So please take note of this. Now there is a surgical management of ankylosing spondylitis, and it is stated in the book, the most common indication for surgery. Everything starts with medical management. However, the most common indication for surgery is severe hip joint arthritis, wherein the pain and stiffness does not respond to the treatments, even to monoclonal antibodies, and it will dramatically be relieved by total hip arthroplasty. So please take note of this. So again, this ends our summary of chapter 355, which is the spondyloarthritis.